Dr. Kazachkin comes to us at a very important time, uh, and I hope I have these dates correct. Uh, it's three months before the world will review the progress on the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, it's four months before the Global Fund's um, pledging conference when the nations across the world pledge their uh, funding to the fund, which is why he's meeting uh, with the PMO and why um, he needs our help uh, in ensuring that the fund gets the support they need to save the million, literally millions of lives that the fund saves. Um, and it is a great, great privilege to introduce him to you this evening. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Kazashkin. Thank you very much, David, for that generous introduction. Uh, everything you said about the Global Fund is to the credit of the people who work at the fund and, and of course, at the credit of, of the countries and the people in country. So, dear members of the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network, dear friends and colleagues in the fight against AIDS and fellow human rights activists. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Bonsoir. It's truly a privilege for me to be here. I'm honored by your invitation. And Richard, I'm truly grateful to you uh, for this and for giving me this opportunity to address uh, the network and this audience today. Um, I'm also, of course, thrilled to be here at the time when um, the announced winner of the award for action on AIDS and human rights um, tonight is, is, is Ralph. I heard you, Joanne, I heard Richard, and I heard the words work, passion, inspiration, and truly there couldn't be a better choice for this award. Ralph has an extraordinary ethical record on all of his work and now that we know each other so much better, I really every day discover how much he's a wonderful person and a wonderful colleague and a friend. So thank you and congratulations again, Ralph. So it's always a pleasure to be among friends in the global health and human rights community who are doing so, so much tremendously important work. I myself wish to dedicate my remarks to two champions for human rights. My friend Jonathan Mann, who was among the first to recognize that we need to put human rights at the center of the response to HIV and AIDS. And to my friend Sasha Tsekanovic, who works in St. Petersburg putting human rights on a daily basis into practice by providing harm reduction services and by treating people who inject drug with respect, with the respect they deserve. In 2005, your organization has actually given Sasha and his organization the International Award for Action on HIV AIDS and Human Rights, um, and that was also um, an excellent and, and greatly deserved choice. I'm of course humbled by the fact that last year's inaugural symposium saw the Honorable Edwin Cameron, Justice of the South African Constitutional Court, come here and give this keynote address. Edwin is one of the most eloquent and outspoken advocates for a right-based response in AIDS. I vividly remember another speech that Edwin gave almost exactly 10 years ago, and that was at the International AIDS Conference in Durban, South Africa. And truly, only few moments in the history of the AIDS epidemic have been as pivotal as Edwin's plenary address at that conference. Edwin's speech helped bring the world's attention to the moral outrage of the failure to provide life-saving 
antiretroviral treatment in much of the developing world where it was desperately needed. It built and supported on the advocacy efforts of other South African activists and laid a foundation for one of the greatest human rights victory in the fight against AIDS, that is the global rollout of antiretroviral treatment. Edwin spoke of how he grew ill with AIDS in 1997 and of his return to health thanks to combination therapy. Amidst the poverty of Africa, he said, I stand before you because I'm able to purchase health. He told the audience also, I'm here because I can afford to pay for life. Edwin appealed to the conscience of a world that was letting poor people die. The speech crystallized sentiment in favor of providing antiretroviral treatment to those who need it in developing countries rather than only in the rich high income countries where treatment had been available since 1996, since the Vancouver conference. The broader global health and human rights movement to which Edwin's speech belongs has led to then important victories and that includes price cuts in medicines, the UN Secretary General's Kofi Annan's call to action on AIDS, and ultimately the creation of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. At the time of Edwin's speech, 10 years ago, many were skeptical that treatment could or should be provided in the developing world and had a long list of arguments against providing treatment. They said that making treatment available would be too expensive, that patients would not be able to adhere to treatment, leading to drug resistance, that the necessary infrastructure was lacking and could not be built, and that providing treatment would not be cost effective. In other words, it could not be done and would not be worth it. Ultimately, all of these claims were proven wrong. Ten years later, it is today five million people in low and middle income countries that are on antiretroviral treatment. And you've heard from David how fast this is progressing. We have made huge progress compared to where we were just five years ago, just one year ago. But in no way is there any room for complacency here. At least another five million people are still in the most urgent need of treatment. The world took action by establishing ambitious targets, such as providing treatment to three million people in developing countries by the end of 2005, remember, three by five. And subsequently, the goal of providing universal access to treatment, care and prevention. By the end of this year, 2010, the goal first articulated by the G8 countries in Glen Eagles in 2005 and then adopted in 2006 by the UN General Assembly. The Global Fund was created to respond to the crisis and make action possible. Importantly, we did take some risk and did not follow the conventional wisdom. But I would argue that if we want to fight, uh, win the fight against AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria, we must be bold and we must make strategic bets as long as we also remain vigilant about the outcomes.